Hi everyone, it's Friday, February 5th, 2016 at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and this is Higher Ed Live Special Edition. I'm your host, Erin Sapinka. On today's live broadcast, we're talking about, uh, oh, wait, where'd it go? We lost the, my, sorry everyone, we lost the script real fast. Um, we're talking about con faculty content and how to strategize it, which I know is a really popular topic because we have great faculty and we need to start learning how to kind of uh, get them talking about current topics, how to get them out there in the open to really showcase we have awesome scholars who are teaching at our colleges. Uh, Special Edition is part of the Higher Ed Live Network, offering viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Live broadcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in the industry. Today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro, the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. All episodes of Higher Ed Live are free and accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com in a podcast form on, and in podcast form format on iTunes. Today's episode is made possible by Expert File. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. Your program pages are some of the most marketing critical on your website, and your faculty has expertise that can provide a critical content pool to raise the prominence of your institution. Do you have a free content strategy to lever these, leverage these important resource, resources? Register now for M. Stoner's free two-part webinar series. We're tweeting out a link now where you can learn more and sign up. And I'm really excited to welcome Peter Evans. He's the co-founder of CEO, Ex CEO of Expert File, the world's first ex expert marketing platform built for organizations. His work in strategic planning and business model innovation draws on over 20 years of experience in working in software, internet services, online media, and telecom, working both in the early stage venture-backed technology startups and publicly traded companies. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Aaron. Glad to be here. By the way, my uh, my mom wrote that bio. So <laughs> longer. Wow, that's really good. My mom would say that I play on the computer all day, um, or that I work on Facebook. That's that's what she tells most people. <laughs> For those of you who will be joining us and watching along, please don't hesitate to ask questions using the hashtag Higher Ed Live. I'll do my best to ask questions as they come in. All right, so let's jump right in. Can you talk a little bit about faculty content just overall real fast and how we should start harnessing it better in higher ed? Yeah, I think one of the things that we want to get done today is just give people a sense of some of the possibilities around faculty content and how we're really shaping the whole concept of uh, content marketing on the campus. As one of our advisors and a person I really look to for trends and such, Mark Greenfield from uh, SUNY Buffalo, as you know, content marketing is still yet to be adopted to, at the rate that we're seeing in corporates on the campus. Uh, we've got a long way to go yet. I think we're so much richer than most organizations because we're swimming in, in academic credentials and, and what journalists would say are credible sources. So I, I think what we want to frame in the discussion today is, is a sense that while you may be whining about how hard it is to work with faculty, minor improvements in things like uh, you know engagement with faculty getting them to opt in for different jobs you need to get done as that storyteller on the campus is going to make a vast improvement in the kind of media gets that you get the quality of that moving beyond regional to national and possibly international media if you can insert yourself at, at relevant uh, times in those stories but you have to be ready as david Meerman scott one of our advisors uh, says uh, news jacking, as we'll talk about today, and real-time marketing is, is the concept of, of speed. And you really can't, um, in an institutional setting, go off in some half-cocked way uh, without being prepared. And, and certainly academics don't want that either. So we'll talk a little bit about that today, I think, in, in the context of engaging faculty. Um, maybe to do a little bit of a revisit from a previous episode on uh, Higher Ed Live, that was done with uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, Deanne Tanzer, uh, with Ashley Butt. Um, I really like uh, the way that Deanne went through a number of principles of working with faculty. Um, and just to sort of recap on some of those in terms of the importance of that, um, just wanted to maybe run you through that. Just give me one second. Okay. And, uh, for some reason, I've got a, a bit of a, an issue technology wise here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just reboot something. Uh, While you're rebooting, can you talk 
a little bit to engaging faculty. So we, I know on my campus, have some faculty who are really great about putting out their own stuff. But yeah, what the faculty that might not be pushing out their content on their own or might not realize that they have the opportunity to push out a piece that they've written or their opinion on something might be an awesome op-ed for a, a, a news organization or something. How do you reach out and really get these faculty involved and excited about contributing to this type of media? Well, there, you know, so again, a, a bit of a segue back into some of the key points that would underscore how you get a relationship built with faculty because you can't just surprise them at the spur of the moment when you've got an opportunity to get them into something. So sort of as a segue to some of the points I was going to make, and I think my laptop was just complaining that I had too many files open there, so I apologize. But this whole notion of walking the halls, staying connected to some of the important research that's going on that faculty are doing, and understanding both the publications that they're doing now and the publications that they have planned. So for instance, uh, let's take Sidney Finkelstein, who's on our platform. Uh, he's with the Dartmouth-Tuck School of Business. Uh, Sidney is a very interesting expert on leadership. He spent a lot of time following the Steve Jobs transition at Apple uh, to Tim Cook. Really interesting topics, but he's got a new book uh, out on, I think it's Super Leaders in about a week, and he's doing some really amazing stuff there. I'm always amazed at how many Marcom people I talk to, media relations people on the campuses that, that really don't have a good grasp of upcoming publications. And I, I would dare to say that the, the Dartmouth folks are, and the Tuck folks are very on top of Sydney's work. But what about some of the other profs, the rising stars that we should be paying attention to? And so staying uh, connected is, is super important. The other one is taking inventory and assessing which experts can be most valuable to you across different types of audiences. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we're gonna talk a bit about that today in terms of the concept of opting those experts into different jobs to be done. I, I don't think we should paint faculty with a broad brush and just look at it through the lens of who's good at broadcast media or who can do print or who can do radio. We need to look at things like blogging. We need to look at internal alumni events, uh, areas where their research could actually add a lot to the conversation, whether it's with donors, whether it's with corporate partners. We work with a lot of universities that are looking to engage corporate audiences as well. So, um, you know, Tapping into um, the experts and opting them in for different types of contribution is one of the key things that we're going to talk about now. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, Sidney Finkelstein is one of our professors here, and his stuff is just always awesome to share. But it is the, the other people that are doing really cool stuff as well that might is right on the verge of breaking or things that we could help push out that would put them on the next level and the next publication or really get them in front of these audiences. Um, so, so um, oh, go ahead. Go, so going into, I guess, the, the sort of contribution index that we do for people, and by the way, I had to do that shout out for Sydney because I've, I've met him before, love his work, but also <laughs> uh, paying homage to you because you're over at Dartmouth, so I had to do that. <laughs> Plus, you know, any, any uh, help we can give Sydney at getting his next bestseller out the door is, is something we want to help. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks great. Um, but what I wanted to just briefly touch on was this whole notion of contribution. So I, I think I, I want to talk about five major takeaways that you can bring back, you know, after you get out of uh, this, this uh, webcast and, and go back and start working on, is do you really have a taxonomy of topics that you understand your faculty speak on. So let's take an example. We work with a, a large healthcare system called UHN, <clears throat> excuse me, University Health Network, and taking somebody like Michael Gardam, Dr. Michael Gardam, who's an infectious disease expert, we would look at a topic taxonomy of infectious disease because that's gonna come up well in Google, but what about Ebola? And what about the Zika virus? Um, he has experience in uh, a multitude of viruses and infectious disease control, both in the hospital and in the community. He's an expert in SARS, which was a crisis that was uh, particularly acute in the Toronto area where he practices medicine. What about Ebola and all these other search terms? So what I'm constantly surprised at is how so many marketers have never done a proper spreadsheet of the faculty that they think may be rising stars or even some of those rock stars 
and done a quick back of the envelope analysis using tools like SEMrush or uh, other keyword analysis tools that can actually provide a relevance indication as to how many people are actually searching on those topics. So we might find that infectious diseases as a topic is flatlining or, you know, it's reasonably steady month over month, but Zika is spiking and Ebola is going to spike again, God forbid, if we end up with a situation again where it may be breaking out in another part of the world. Um, so I think it's really important that if we can do a little bit of back of the envelope analysis, even on the topics and tagging that in faculty profiles and also how we speak to the media to key in on key search topics, we can in some cases get a five, 10, 15 times lift on the actual relevance, which is really important. So very important to get that going. Now, when we think about contributions, speaking is important. We speak to the media, we speak internally at events to partners, corporations, sponsors, donors, uh, you know, alumni, all of these places where faculty can make a difference in the quality of the conversation. But we need to really start building out a contribution index that tags those faculty against those jobs to be done. So I, I may not speak on broadcast TV because I, I hate my hair, my roots are showing, or I'm ugly. I have a face for radio, so put me on. And so I'll do, you know, regional radio, um, NPR, but don't put me on TV. And then you've got other people saying, I am completely afraid of getting on stage. I'm completely afraid of being on radio or TV, but I will write for you. So just even having a framework that allows you to understand what those people are going to do for you there across print, blogs, op-eds, break it down into a granular fashion. And then other people will say, you know, I don't want to speak, I don't want to write, but I will help you with research. And I may do some research on a topic. If you're building out a report or a feature for an alumni magazine or you're doing something for the website, uh, there are many people, including graduate students, as well as faculty and staff, that are very happy if called upon to do additional research. And some of that might be on social media to figure out influencers, and they might already know who those people are, all the way down to more academic, hardcore research about a topic to give those uh, talking heads, the other experts, uh, more information to go on and to help you shape the story. And then lastly, what about the social media savvy uh, staff and faculty? Some of them may not be as decorated a researcher, but are extremely good storytellers and quite influential and they have good social channels that they can, they can use to amplify your brand. How are you accounting for the influence that those people have and how are we feeding them with content that might help uh, move your brand along as a school? Yeah, that, I just, I, I love all of this because I work frequently with professors who are very active on Twitter, um, and on social media in general as my role as a social media manager and then you'll have some professors who slowly get into it and they I just spending some time with them and kind of helping them understand the social media effect that could that could really push their work out there um, in front of audiences is just really awesome and it's great to sit down and kind of work with them rather than just tweeting it from a institute handle it's actually similar to what Twitter does for everyone. It gets this hands-on approach to people that normally you might not have contact with. You can shoot a quick DM to someone or ask them for a quick follow so that you can get contact information to begin a conversation. And I just, I love that faculty can become that approachable through social. And I think that's an awesome way to push them out. I love that. So what we're sort of lacking right now are tools that help marketing departments better bring all this information together. I mean, we do that as expert file with our clients to bring out these beautiful multimedia biographical profiles that swim in the website and in our, our global expert network. But on the back end, I think what we're really getting excited about as well is just our, our professional services and how we work strategically with schools to help them better get this information together and get people opted in more. So one of the things that I want to offer is anybody that's interested, we're delighted to share some frameworks, uh, you know, a spreadsheet sort of Google Docs format to get people started. I mean, they don't need our software to do this uh, or to at least start thinking about it. it certainly automates a lot of this better 
um, if they're uh, if they're working with us. But we want to share at least uh, some of these frameworks to get people going. Uh oh. All of this content that you're using needs to be formatted in a different way because we're seeing a, a fundamental shift as we move more to digital, but as we move more to mobile formats. And as we see major trends in the way that we consume content as consumers or even as business customers looking at a complex um, solution, and I would call uh, shopping for graduate school or going to an international university for those that are in, uh, you know, recruitment roles, a, a complex buying process that people are going through. But putting uh, content out there for a range of different jobs to be done, we're seeing a major trend in five areas. There's more, but I'll focus on five. One is that you've got to have really, really snackable faculty content. It's got to be bite-sized. It's got to be in a variety of formats, uh, everything from 60-second video to tweets, uh, very, very simple blog posts that draw people to everything from infographics that people can get the, the basic premise of what you're trying to say. I think content increasingly needs to be more shareable across a variety of media. So we're seeing more clients that are demanding a write once, share multiple times and, and in multiple formats and across platforms. It has to be highly visual. We're moving from a text world of boring headshots of faculty, boring biographies that maybe have a little bit of academic publications to um, faculty profiles that need to be much more multimedia and social oriented. Uh, because quite frankly, if a journalist is evaluating you uh, for, for broadcasts, let's say, that's really table stakes these days. It has to be portable. Marketing departments don't have a lot of time anymore to uh, produce content that can't be, with the push of a couple of buttons, uh, moving to multiple areas of their uh, website uh, and, and to social as well, as I mentioned, and sharing. And then lastly, I think this content needs to be produced at such a speed today for the news cycle especially, and even for, for users or, or, or audiences that really are tuning out of topics after a while. Right now, the US election is red hot. The Zika virus is red hot. It hopefully will not be red hot as a disease state in a month from now, uh, if we can get things together there. So this notion of synchronization with the, the broadcast news cycle is becoming a more acute uh, issue for schools and a big opportunity if they get it right. Yeah, um, I just remember back whenever Ebola was happening, it was professor, we were looking at the medical professors and, doc, and, prof, and doctors from our med school that could potentially be experts in questions. And because that's what everyone's looking for at that point in time is, okay, can you explain if it's just the basics of the disease or how it will? Um, and with just the politics currently going on, the political campaign has been an awesome opportunity for professors and faculty in economics and um, just all different from business to all different uh, assets, even to medical professionals who discuss medical health insurance and the different ramifications or how different candidates policies will work out. And it's just once you start get once you start your brain kind of going and thinking about, okay, well, here's how this work and this will work with them if they talk on this, but then they could branch off and talk about this. It's it's faculty are awesome content producers um, and getting them to create that content or help you create content for them or with them is just, it creates some really awesome opportunities to show the world, the scholars that you have on your campus. Um, and so you mentioned newsjacking. And so I'm a huge, I love newsjacking. We keep going back to this newsjacking topic. And um, can, you, can you continue talking a little bit more about how you can position and jump in with faculty um, so that you, you said that having it prepared ahead of time and going through it, but once you, let's say an instance happens um, and you need a professor to talk about Ebola, how, Ebola, how do you kind of get those conversations going and start pushing out the content out there? Well, great question. And, and really the principles of newsjacking is, is David Meerman Scott coined the term and I think owns the dot com, which was a smart uh, move on his part. Um, really, they're very basic principles, but I think the way he framed it um, is very easy to understand. It's, 
It's the concept of adding value to a journalist when an emerging story breaks. Uh, and see how news disseminates. Some of the, the, the work that Burson Marsteller has done as an agency shows the, the pace of how news disseminates. And we look at sort of ground zero, and let's say there's an accident and somebody gets a video of it, and then they post it to Facebook, and then we've all seen the Twitter feed later with the hashtag, and you'll see how reporters and even Chase producers are now asking for the rights to rebroadcast that, and then they're putting it into post-production, and maybe um, they're iterating on top of that to frame the story a little bit more. And you think about how the reporter needs to do their job. Well, why did this happen? Let's get an expert, and uh, you know, Kel Surprise. So now we need to to talk about that. I look at uh, you know the the disappearance of MH370, uh, uh, and in terms of the just how many experts we needed to bring on to keep CNN rolling for months and months when no wreckage was actually being found. It was experts that powered that, maybe a little bit longer than it needed to go on, uh, because uh, there was only so many you know conspiracy theories that we could come up with on that. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, it just shows the importance of experts in that. So that's really going to be where you as a marketer can add an incredible amount of value. But within the first 30 minutes, according to some of the research, it's really a buzz on Twitter and it's starting to permeate on, you know, regional media, radio and people like that are picking it up. It's hitting online websites and then it's starting to move to newspapers and then longer formats at the back end will be like Time Magazine or an op-ed piece in the New York Times after people have had a chance to frame their opinion. So what we've been doing is some work to sort of build on a lot of David's theories about the value of news jacking and the value of experts as to what they can bring to the party. And I think what we're now developing is a richer conversation with marketing departments on what they need to do with experts to make sure that they get a disproportionate amount of love from the media. And here's what I'd say you need to focus on. Five things. Are you discoverable? Are you relevant? Are you credible? Are you engaging? And are you responsive? And that's not just the expert, but it's the marketing department, the handlers that are helping that expert, whether it's getting them prepped and driven, driving them over to a, a studio at, uh, at VideoLink uh, to do a broadcast with a TV station, or it's actually just trying to find them on the campus and pull them out of class because you've just got a big get with the economist and they need a quote uh, for deadline. Uh, these are the, un, you know, the, this is what our unsung heroes do on the campus, you know, day in, day out. But it all has to come together in a very, very quick sequence. So if you take the journalists and what they're doing in the moment, I need to know you exist. I got to find you. And what we're trying to do at Expert File is make experts more discoverable with a global expert network. So the notion of coming up in search, um, again, back to keyword relevance. Are you even tagging your content and faculty profiles and other areas of your site in ways that Google is gonna find that? Because most of the journalists that I talk to, Google is a very big friend of theirs and they will do very literal searches. So if you go, you know, uh, Los Angeles cardiology expert and I see the first academic that comes up affiliated with a local hospital, I might as a Chase producer just go right there. Um, you know, across the um, uh, multiple formats, you've got to be discoverable um, in, in different formats. So what I mean by that is, uh, are you coming up in mobile, for instance, in, in mobile responsive formats? I'm still amazed at how many institutions uh, are not fully mobile responsive. And last time I checked, journalists are living on their mobile phones. They're not in the desktop world anymore. So this is really important. So moving beyond discoverability, once I know you exist, I need to know that you're relevant. So if I call a journalist on the Tyco uh, Johnson Controls merger, and I am a legal expert on mergers, that's not as interesting. Now this might sound funny, but this is where the accountant gets interesting on tax inversion schemes and how to essentially um, uh, save on tax through the, the type of thing that they're, they're now saying these companies will be engaged in because they're now moving head office to Ireland and they're doing some interesting things. That's really interesting to the media. It's very interesting to the White House and the Obama administration who's trying to keep tax in the United States. So if you're trying to get people to pay attention to your expertise, 
and you're an expert in tax inversion and you have an accounting background and a PhD in accounting, um, that can get pretty boring until all of a sudden an event like the Tyco Johnson Controls merger comes along. Uh, m a uh, So very interesting to really understand how your relevance goes up and, and tagging yourself to current news is really important. So at that point, once I know that, that you exist and that you are relevant, it's going to be a very a simpler process to understand if you're credible or not. Uh, I, what published work have you done? And this third stage is really where I look at your, your qualifications. Do you have a PhD? There's a certain amount of safety in working with a marketing department at a university or college and who is essentially as an institution endorsing that expert and providing a lot of things that are a bit of a safety blanket for me if I'm looking for a credible source. But there are two more hoops to jump through. Number four is if you are discoverable and I found you and you're highly relevant to the topic, and you are credible and you have a PhD, but you can't put a noun and a verb together on camera, that's a problem. So you've got to be engaging. So I'm looking at multimedia, I'm looking at video, I'm looking at social. I'm really trying to understand if you're really engaged in that area. And if you've got a blog that talks about, you know, some of the, the tax legislation that's coming through Congress and, and, and you're really an expert that's published a lot on tax reform, and you've got a perspective that's in some ways maybe provocative, you're going to get noticed. And the last one then is, and it's where a number of uh, problems occur. I discovered you, you're highly relevant, you've got the book knowledge and the qualifications. I think you'd be amazing on camera, but we just can't get you to return our calls. We can't get you to get that information in our hands for deadline, and that's a problem. So again, we're focusing this on uh, media, but I think that's really true of uh, so many other um, jobs to be done. If we're trying to book somebody for scientific conferences and symposia, four or five other notable PhDs might have been invited to participate in that event uh, on a panel or to do a keynote or a workshop that if they were to speak there, that academic could bring a lot of credibility and, and reputation uh, back to the, to the college or university. So we need a way to um, get back to journalists faster and, and give them a commitment that we're going to service their requirements for deadlines faster. And that's unfortunately, if, if your um, faculty profiles are, are linked to their email address, uh, that's usually a warning flag uh, to me that you're probably losing a fair number of opportunities because faculty are not necessarily synchronized with the real-time news cycle. If I'm going into clinic or I've got a class or maybe I just don't care and maybe that wasn't the right person they should be going for. So you need to be part of that uh, workflow as well. Uh, I That kind of was like a little brain blown moment there because that really that is so interesting to me that just a link an email to the faculty you're losing that potential as a marketer or a communicator for your college to be that one to be aware of what's happening and to help either coach the faculty or to make sure that everything's going smoothly or to be that response person when they are busy with class um, that's just an incredible tip to you mentioned two things that at the beginning that really sparked something that I remembered. We've, we have a professor who, when he does TV hits, will actually bring a couple of his students into the studio room with him so that they can get a chance to see him speaking um, at kind of, not on his feet, but as he's speaking and being asked questions that uh, from a news organization on live TV. And that's an incredible learning experience and it extends the classroom experience, I think, to the next level of, okay, I'm studying economics, but what like how does that play into the real world or what can i what can i do next with this and it it i've sat in in a couple of those tv studio hits where these students will get a chance to listen and just hear their professor really kind of um just be in his have his moment and be really uh well like knowledgeable and just have this vast knowledge and i think it adds one experience to the student but also it highlights how valuable this professor this professor teaches you every day of the week but he's also being pegged by cnn and all of these different export expert uh, resources looking for his information and his input and i think that just adds so much value to the education process from a student side point uh, uh, the and the other thing that i thought 
of when you were speaking a little bit earlier was with social media and how quickly and uh, active people are on that. I think of all the times that as I was studying for my journalism degree that if I was looking to cover a story on campus or of the larger uh, city where I lived, I would go to Twitter and look to see if there was any sort of conversation happening around it or talking about it, um, even in the slightest bit, to find potential sources or other people that I could talk to, to at least get a foot in the door to understand the situation that's occurring or whatever thing I was covering. So I think that's just absolutely fabulous. I'm loving this conversation. I'm trying not to look like a nerd here, just like shaking my head yes, as you say everything, because I just feel like a bobblehead, because I'm like, yes, that makes so much sense. I love this. I love this. I love this. Um, well, I'm a bit so of a nerd on this stuff as well, Aaron, <laughs> and, and, you know, sometimes my staff will tell me I'm boring them incredibly, <laughs> but, you know, it, as long as we're, we're talking about this, I think one of the things that's really important that from, from where I sit is I, I'm not just a practitioner because I've been on the agency side and I've also been a CMO and I've, I've done the TV thing. I've done tons of public speaking, both workshops and keynotes at, at industry conferences. You know, I've done the Europe thing that, you know, all over the place. I even just did a gig recently, a workshop in Beijing. Um, and what I'll tell you is, is that I, I, Expert File was really in many ways born out of, uh, uh, you know, scratching my own itch <laughs> where we saw some big issues uh, with the way that marketing departments are managing expert talent for speaking opportunities, for media opportunities, even um, because there's so many jobs to be done, yet we're not doing a good job of categorizing all that talent and sort of federating it in a way that um, you can actually um, work collaboratively across the whole campus. And we're working in some cases with um, schools that are, are putting 1,500 experts on expert file. And it gets really interesting because to give you an example of how well this can work, um, you know, we hadn't even launched the client uh, fully with 400 experts that we had put on the platform in the first eight weeks using workflow. And you, we talked about that sort of leaky issue of faculty emails being the way to you know, get in touch with somebody. By building a proper process for the school, we were able to get 110 inquiries for that school in the first eight weeks. Seven inquiries were actually from tier one media. So we track eight different types speaking requests, donor requests, all sorts of inquiries. But in the media category, seven of them were from Al Jazeera, Fast Company, CBS, uh, New Zealand Radio. Interesting, uh, global media coming in to uh, inquire on different story ideas. Um, and what we're seeing now is a richer conversation where our clients, just to give a, a couple of them a quick shout out, Wake Forest is using us for the 2016 elections. But they're, not, they're going farther than that to say we have experts that can talk about a broad range of topics related to the 2016 presidential race. So around social issues, economic issues, religious issues, legal issues. Um, I'm, I'm sure they're talking about Ted Cruz and, and whether he really is Canadian or American. <laughs> right? We get a real kick out of um, you know, Wheaton College, which is arguably the Harvard of Christian colleges in Chicago, uh, Latanya um, at Taylor at Wheaton has done an incredible job of telling stories through the lens of her faculty. And she's doing things like uh, with her faculty on something around the Paris attacks and the psychology of the Paris attacks and how we as a society need to behave uh, post attacks in a way to heal better. And I think that's a, a beautiful message coming from, um, uh, you know, evangelicals and Christians uh, that are at a college and in such a rich academic environment like Wheaton. And then we've got McCombs Business School because we can't uh, overlook the state of Texas in Austin uh, at uh, University of Texas, Austin. The, they're a top five research uh, school doing some really amazing work on things like the VW emissions scandal and tying that back to the market capitalization of Volkswagen post that and using a little bit of economics to figure out um, what the implications of that are to help reporters build more stories on that. So these are just some of the things that they're publishing out there with their experts. And it's living inside their newsroom. It's living inside faculty profiles. Again, speaking to that shareability and that portability, they're getting it out on social, but they're also building 
uh, a stronger owned footprint uh, of that content, which is going to get indexed better by Google, but also when people come to the site, those variety, that variety of audiences is going to find that content much more engaging. At the end of all this, what we got to do is make our faculty more relevant to what everybody cares about, whether it's you know an intellectual um, sitting on Capitol Hill writing policy, all the way down to the famous Joe the Plumber. Uh, we have to make faculty um, more. We have to merchandise their work in a way that plays to a variety of audiences, because these people are going to send their kids to your school. Uh, they're going to give money to your school. They're going to influence policymakers that that influence the funding streams for education. All this stuff comes together in a wonderful way if we do a better job with those experts. And I think it's a two-way street there. Yeah. Uh, again, I just shake my head yes, because all of this just seems to make so much sense to me. Um, we do have a question from Twitter, so I want to ask you real quick. Uh, what kind of success metrics can you share to help make the case for investment in faculty content strategy? Well, I mean, one of the things that we did recently with one of our clients is I, I looked at a, a total ROI just on some of their media hits and defined uh, an earned value. And, and I won't tell you what the school is, but I'll tell you what the number was, about $960,000 on earned media uh, that they would see. And that was only with a couple of hundred experts on our platform. But that's only extracting... Um, uh, the, the first quarter of results. I think it would go up from that. Um, you know, there's been some interesting research by Robert Wynn, who's been doing a fair amount of re media research, who's a Forbes columnist. I highly recommend Rob and, and his work around the PR profession. And he runs a conference called the Business Access Media Conference. So if you're listening and you're from a business school, you need to get to that conference and really learn some of the principles that Rob uh, talks about there along with the media that are coming to that conference. He's very interested in media measurement right now and I think this is a problem that we have um, in the media profession is that we're still working on some very soft metrics. We've got to make it a, a much more scientific analytical thing. So the first thing you've got to do is when you quantify ROI, you have to start on the journey of saying we are taking our contribution up We've got more people blogging, writing, researching, doing social. This is how many more Twitter accounts that we activated with faculty. This is how we're growing our footprint on social. This is how many, um, and then moving beyond that contribution, uh, how many speaking requests are we getting? Uh, how many media hits are we getting? And then is it regional or is it international media? There's so many ways to manage this beyond just a standard clip report. But we can't be doing this whole, you know, measuring the clip report by the inch and putting it together in that way. There's so many other ways that faculty can add value beyond media. I know that our administrations want that. I know that boards of trustees want to see that. Uh, but it's only one element of what we do to build the school's reputation. But uh, so looking at media measurement, uh, Rob Wynn says, Take the earned value of a story that the equivalent value of what that ad rate would be a multiplied times 10, because he sees that as the, the, the earned value versus uh, what paid advertising would do, which is in many cases nothing, uh, because it doesn't build the same kind of credibility if you're paying for it. If you're being endorsed by third parties like uh, notable media, it can be all the way up to 10x. So I took a, just a back of the envelope uh, analysis of some media that one of our clients had been getting over their first quarter and took a 960,000. But guess what I did? I took the earned media of their tier one and then I actually um, divided the rate card stuff by 50%. I actually divided by half instead of multiplied times 10. And then I extracted on an annualized basis without actually bumping it up because it would presumably be working more with our platform on that. And we came up with about 960,000 back of the envelope. That's just media. That doesn't include speaking. It doesn't include grad students. It doesn't include international student inquiries, uh, donor interest. It doesn't talk to a lot of the site engagement that we might be generating, which uh, you know is difficult to quantify outside of the page views and other things like that. But um, it, there's clearly a defined ROI that we're seeing 
that's coming out of this. And, and for many of the reasons that we have a website. Uh, why do we have a website? <laughs> why are we investing half a million sometimes or, or a million dollars in a website? Why are we doing parallax scroll, drone shots and, and big videos and stuff? Because we're trying to create both an emotional and a rational connection to our school and amplifying uh, what we're doing. But I would say, and this is my soliloquy for today, you've got to get the faculty on board and get them into the story more uh, because otherwise it's, it's just a lot of uh, noise at the end of the day. Is that helpful? Yes, I, I'm sitting here already brainstorming, um, which brings me to another question personal that I have. Uh, so thinking of people that might not, that understand they need to start positioning their faculty, but let's say they're a small team or they don't have the staff to really help them support and push out faculty. Um, do you have suggestions on small steps that they can take to start putting out faculty as experts, whether it be um, contacting a faculty member for a quick quote that they plop into an infographic that they share on Twitter or um, yeah. other yeah. things like just small steps that if I'm by myself uh, and I wanted to push out that I know I have this great professor who knows all about uh, the a political scandal that's happened or something. How, what small steps could I take as a army of one or an army of small uh, to push that person out? Well, what I like about the clients we work with is we have really large campus environments that we work with where all of LMU is moving over to expert file. UNC Chapel Hill is another major um, you know, university client. And we're taking a lot of the best practices that you'll find with the most sophisticated research universities and working in some cases with awesome, awesome colleges, that maybe regional and smaller marketing departments that have got a lot to work with. They certainly don't have a lot of people though and they may be constrained by their content management or, or social uh, solutions that they've got. Um, the first thing you've got to do is make sure that you've got a, a really good understanding as to your topics. There's nothing that's gonna work for you unless you have an ability to match topics uh, to an actual faculty expert and then recognize when something's coming off your Feedly or whatever you're using, uh, Google Alerts to um, match that is, it, it just, it isn't going to happen for you fast enough for you to be relevant in the news cycle to any media unless you can actually do that effortlessly. So a lot of the work uh, begins here, uh, you know, it, you know, the battle's won before it begins really. So there, there are no shortcuts is the first thing is you've got to map that out if it's in a spreadsheet or if it's in our software even better because then you can do it a little bit faster. But um, the thing that we're seeing now is micro formats. So being able to create what we call spotlights really, really fast in the content management system and put them into the newsroom. So if you want to see an example of that, uh, Macomb School of Business at University of Texas, Austin has integrated um, spotlights directly into uh, their newsroom. And then those spotlights also go on the faculty profile because they may have actually been uh, found as, as faculty right through a Google search, not through the newsroom. So again, this notion of portable formats. Here's what you need as ingredients uh, to do this properly. You've got to have proper biographical assets. You've got to have a bit of multimedia to, ready to go, ideally. You've got to make sure that you've aligned on the right topic and you've got to figure out an angle on the story. So this is where your value as a marketing professional comes in. Uh, as a storyteller, you've got to figure out a way to extend that story for the journalist. You know, the fact that man bites dog is a story, well, that's the first story. So why did the, the man bite the dog? What's the background on the man? How many, uh, how many men are, are, are going to bite dogs in the future? What does the re research say? I'm getting silly here, but you know, when we sort of do journalism 101, um, we start thinking about ways that we can add value. So the big thing right now is, is having all of that stuff ready to go. What we're doing in Spotlight is allowing, say, a McCombs to go and publish something on the Volkswagen emissions scandal in a timely way and to drop a lift quote in immediately into Spotlight, which is important because in some cases, we're now seeing that even the Associated Press is grabbing lift quotes off school sites. Why? Because the school is credible and it's, it's fast and it, it, it's not going to get anybody fired and they're on deadline. And they don't often uh, have 
the time to, to do all the things they want to do on a story. So that's really important, that lift quote. Uh, if I'm not going to use it, I may want to shake it up a little bit, in which case I want to talk to you, Aaron, on the campus and, 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 and also talk to that uh, faculty expert. Are they accessible? They have to be ready to go. And we're starting to look a lot more at ways that we can help the journalists do their job and broadcast around giving them ideas on where to find a broadcast site and, and helping route them to uh, the fastest way to engage that expert. It might actually just be a, qu a quick Twitter session or an IM session. Maybe Slack will be the way that that happens over time. I don't know. But we're looking at a variety of really interesting formats where we can be more responsive. I would love Slack to be the new. I love Slack. I'm a huge Slack supporter. But um, as well. we, we ran over our 10,000 free limit on Slack and in the first couple of months as a team. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just fantastic. We love it. It's replaced a lot of our email. Uh, that's that's what I love. I I understand the value and importance of email, but I also can hate it at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, doing well in the educational segment, from what I understand, they're they're killing it right now. And so go Slack. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am just blown away. I'm I'm absolutely like my like I said, my brain is already brainstorming ways that I can start doing better faculty positioning in my own job as a social media manager. Um, and I just want to thank you for your time today. And just one quick reminder before we kind of start closing out with a few final questions. If you have any questions, please tweet them using the Higher Ed Live hashtag, and I'll make sure to try and squeeze them in before we wrap up the show today. Um, and so we were, you started mentioning, you mentioned all these great lists. Um, resources that you could share that people could find uh, to read more about this or resources that you have that we could push out or I could read and share with my office. Um, anything that you recommend? Sure. I mean, uh, we have got some extra copies of David Merriman Scott's book. So if people are interested in that, I'll, I'll give away some free copies of that. Say to the first five people that get back to you or tweet expert file that they want a copy of the book. Let's do that. Why not? So we'll give away <laughs> some books. Um, we've got a case study in there of where we took a, a smaller university um, and, and really started to expand their media footprint by getting people into breaking news. So I would highly recommend that you pick up a copy of David's Fifth Rules of uh, the New Rules of Marketing. Uh, sorry, the New Rules of Marketing and PR is the name of the book, published by Wiley. And uh, it's, it's an amazing updated version. That's become a standard for a lot of people that are in journalism right now. Uh, and marketing. Uh, I would also suggest our blog is a really good resource of information. There's two blog posts that Deanne Tanzer has done that I really like around faculty experts and how to work better with them. Kind of a 10 point plan. It talks about how to get buy in from the administration and other people around this, how you need peer to peer uh, love as well, where you can get an initial gaggle of experts uh, liking what you're doing in terms of this approach and then telegraphing to the rest of them. Uh, that's a really important, um, you know, principle of project management when you're trying to do change management, taking a few people and holding them up as the, you know, putting them in the spotlight and rewards and incentives and other things like that that are so important in all this because it's, it, we're playing the long game with content marketing. Uh, there, there are no shortcuts. I think people that are looking for shortcuts are going to be really disappointed. Um, it's one part storytelling. It's one part tech. It's one part, you know, psychology of working with teams. It's, there's so much to this that we have to learn, which is why we're all going to be employed for a long time, I think, doing this, which is good. Uh, in terms of other uh, areas, I, I highly recommend that you um, start reading some of the, the stuff that we're picking up with uh, uh, Mark uh, Greenfield's got some great uh, stuff on his blog and on Twitter. And I'll also get Mark to maybe put together a bit of a list on that because we're speaking at Case 2 in Philadelphia next week. And I was actually just in the process of putting together some hot links that we can send off. So however you want to share that, Aaron, I'll get you some stuff as a follow-up on that. And I'll put together a Google Doc on the contribution index and some of the things that you want to actually start collecting to start this journey around getting your experts engaged. And so we're happy to share that. 
that all sounds awesome and thank you so much. Um, in case anyone missed it, make sure you tweet uh, them and Higher Ed Live to get a free copy of some of the books that he mentioned and we'll be tweeting out some of the resources that he mentioned later today too. And I just want to thank you for an awesome hour. I've learned a ton and I think that our viewers as well have. I know that my brain is already going and thinking of ways that we can start doing things differently and switching it up and I want to see if we have a taxonomy because I just want one for myself because I love spreadsheets like that. Um, but thank you so much for joining me, Peter. Uh, and thank you guys for tuning in with me today. And thanks again always to our sponsors, M. Stoner and Expert File. Have a great rest of your day, guys. Thanks very much, Aaron. Pleasure.